morning. My name is Max. I'm one of the orthopaedic residents. I'll be presenting on open fractures today. So the definition of an open fracture is a fracture with direct communication to the external environment. Uh, that seems very simple and quite self-explanatory, but the difference between a closed and an open fracture uh, is very different in their management, complication rate, prognosis. Uh, as a comparison in 1850, open fractures were traditionally managed quite often with early amputation just because the infection risk was so large. While still in those times, casting and close reduction was reasonably effective for closed uh, fractions. In those times, again, with amputation and gangrene and not very good septic antiseptic technique, mortality rates was 25 to 50 percent. Uh, nowadays, since then, it's still reasonably high in uh, the 1900s, 1950s, when aseptic technique has been pioneered and closed, open fracture management was much improved. Mortality rates were still, or comorbidities and poor morbidity after open fracture was still around 9%. Now, some gory pictures, just for an example of what you might see in an open fracture. These are quite obvious and you know, I certainly wouldn't think they'd be missed, but you can see why it may be a major problem is you have a, a usually sterile area that is now open to the external environment. And often, as you can see, these were likely high um, force injuries. There can be lots of contaminants, dirt, road, gravel in these wounds, which can cause problems with infection. Now, as I mentioned, oftentimes open fractures are due to high speed or high energy collisions. Um, the incidence is 30.7 per 100,000 persons per year. Seemingly more common in young males, often due to kind of the more association with high speed traumas, motorbike accidents, car accidents, um, sports injuries and falls. And also in older females, often because of more brittle bones and brittle skin and more prone to falling. The most common sites are the phalanges, which are about half of all open fractures, followed by kind of the tibia, the distal radius, and then the other bones of the body. You can see the common mechanisms of injury there on the right. Most of these, as I mentioned, seem to be related to motor vehicle accidents, and the pedestrian there, it involves a pedestrian being hit by a car or bike. The other common way of causing open fractures are what are called torsional injuries. So for example, that finger earlier, if you even fall from a standing height, but you happen to hit a particular angle that puts um, torsional or angular stress on the joint or the bone, and it is a thin bone like the phalange, it's reasonable for it to uh, open the skin and to extrude from the body just from that lower level of force. Now, in assessing an open fracture, as always, history, examination, investigations. History in this case might divulge some of those high energy traumas or provide you a particular suspicion of an open fracture. For example, if, it, if they mentioned that there was all dirt in the wound that they had to clean out, you might be more um, focused in your examination, but really the examination is the primary thing and it should always be high uh, in your index of suspicion to look for an open fracture. Sometimes patients come in with wounds already dressed or wrapped up or even in a cast if they've come from a, a GP clinic or otherwise. And the patient may tell you, oh, there's no grazes, there's nothing there, it's all okay. You still have to check and you have to do a very thorough examination, look throughout the joint above and below and throughout the area that's been injured to see if you can see any skin defect, any um, protrusion, and if in doubt, and there is a small wound in the area of the fracture, treat it as an open fracture. Uh, with regards to investigations, as always, X-ray and CT is useful. May also provide an extra thing, even though, as I mentioned, examination is king. If you see any lockings of gas or any very easily visible skin defects on those imaging, it makes, again, since it's the diagnosis of an open fracture. Now, to, once you've found an area or a skin defect that you think may be an open fracture, there's various classification scales because the actual fracture 
or the wound may just be a little pin hole like that or it may be a larger defect like this one or it may be as those first slides demonstrated quite a pronounced extruding bone and describing them over the phone um, we've developed a few ways with which to do that that's widely understood. The most widely used one is the Gustillo classification. This is an older one and there are some um, research showing that the sensitivity and specificity isn't the best. There is a high degree of inter-observer reliability and the type 2 category is quite wide in its definition. But in general, type 1s are more your minor. For example, that pinhole wound would be a type 1. Minimal contamination, very low infect post-operative infection rates. Type 2 would be a larger wound, um, moderate contamination, moderate infection rate as well, while your type 3s, which are subdivided into A, B and C, are your more larger, um, much more risky and much more extensive wounds, larger than 10 centimetres. The subdivisions of the categories A, B and C are more based on, uh, from the surgical side, the degree of repair and also subdividing that infection risk. Basically, if it's local coverage, you still have quite good outcomes, but if there's more um, reconstruction work or injure, injury to vascular structures involved, those infection rates, of course, go up, and the complication rates as well. The other major classification scheme is the Suchern grading, more modern. Um, papers seem to show that this one is slightly more reliable with its um, between observers but it doesn't seem to be as widely used. Similarly divides open fractures into different divisions. These ones are called grades, grades one through four, four. Uh, one being in similar small puncture wounds and four being your more extreme incomplete or complete amputations with similar kind of infection rates and similar management between. So to go back to those images, that small pinhole, as I mentioned, would be a type one gustillo and probably a grade one Suchern, while this would be a grade two and a type two of both. Now, regarding the initial management of open fractures, so there's good evidence that shows that urgent IV antibiotics, and I'll get to our choices soon, uh, has a good effect on the uh, outcome of these open fractures. Earlier is better. Patients often need uh, an ADT booster if they have an unclear um, vaccination history is a particularly soiled wound and um, oftentimes it's given kind of as a, a prophylactic thing even if the patient thinks oh, I've had, I think I had it four three years ago the ADT is very low risk and low has not many side effects and is quite useful in these circumstances to make sure that tetanus immunization is up to date and then in the interim stabilisation of the wound and dressing. Now there is uh, varying evidence about washout in ED. Certainly the, the larger pieces, if there is like easily retrieved pits of gravel or, or organic tissue or anything that can be removed, it should be. But there's also some papers coming out that show that aggressive irrigation down in ED can actually uh, further introduce some of the smaller particles, smaller contaminants inside the wound and make it harder to wash it out properly in theatre afterwards. Dressing can be done with saline soaked gauze just over the top to keep that wound moist and prevent any further intrusion of contaminants until it can be managed in theatre. Now with regards to antibiotics, so there is very good evidence showing that early antibiotics um, improves outcomes but the definition of early is quite variable. Um, one study showed a, a 4.7% of post-operative infection rate when antibiotics were given with three hours, within three hours of injury, and then 7.4 after. Another study so it showed 0% infection when it was given within 66 minutes and 17% after. But other studies haven't really shown a significant level of difference, and they've all been of varying sizes and varying samples. So the jury is still a little bit out on the exact time recommendations. A lot of hospitals use a six hour rule. And again, the evidence seems to suggest that the earlier the better, and ideally as soon as you have a suspicion of open fracture, I don't think there'd be any harm with early antibiotics. Um, other rules, uh, sorry, other rules in, 
So early antibiotics is definitely a recommendation, but, but closure often is the next thing we have to think about and the timing of that. Regarding which antibiotics to use, again, local hospital policies will guide you. And from the original Bustillo paper, which kind of explained, uh, explored a lot of the open fractures, it seems first generation Keflosporin, so Keflozolin, is useful for your Bustillo 1 or 2 grades. And after that, you could continue changing to a third generation IV Keflosporin or adding like gentamicin to your antibiotic regime. In more complicated circumstances where there's arm injury or bowel contamination, you need some anaerobe cover, um, high dose penicillins are also recommended. And then there's also, if it's a particularly interesting wound where it's in a, a dam or something, or there's fresh water, then it might be an idea to speak to some of the infectious diseases doctors. There are um, quinolones and things which they use in those circumstances. Now, operative management. So similar um, findings as I mentioned with the antibiotics for operative management, the earlier seems to be the better. The goals of that are threefold. One is for washout and debridement, cleaning the wound, managing the source of any infection. And again, similar evidence in the papers showing that early washout and debridement have much lower infection rates, much lower complication rates, something around if it's under five hours, 7%, greater than five hours, 38% from a paper in 1995. More recent studies, because um, modern care often does wash out quite promptly for these things, hasn't shown a statistically significant difference, but still aiming to and bring those patients to theatre as urgently as possible for that management. The complicating factor of that care is that there is um, a fracture underneath and depending on the degree of that fracture you may be looking to um, fixate or reduce that operatively and if you're doing that in an infected field you may be a bit hesitant to use metaware or other um, uh, nails or other things inserting into that field. And so time, fra time frames around timing of the actual definitive fracture management is often surgeon dependent and injury dependent. The final part of the management is soft tissue coverage. As I mentioned with the, the grading beforehand, with for example 11 A, B and C, it's variable and depending on the injury may require complicated um, flaps or skin grafts. And so often one of the other things in considering your operative time frame is if you're in a hospital that um, has plastic support, organising a time for the orthopaedic washout and management of the fracture and then in the same operative um, setting, also including some skin grafts or flaps to manage the actual skin closure. In saying that, you can appreciate it's quite a complicated thing to manage open fractures and complications are common from some of the numbers I quoted earlier. It's dependent on the degree of the, the wound, the, the size of the area that's um, involved, the degree of contamination, but it's very common to have some degree of post-operative wound infection. There is a risk as well in these cases of osteomyelitis. Um, compartment syndrome, as with all fractures, can be a risk as well, and having an open fracture and an open um, wound does not preclude you from having a compartment syndrome, so it is something we should always be vigilant regarding. Other risks, and particularly higher in open fractures, likely complicating, are due to the complicating factors of their fixation and, un and um, healing is the non-union or the failure of soft tissue healing overlying. And again, it's just something that often means patients with open fractures have poorer outcomes than closed fracture patients, simply because their hospital stays are longer, um, operative times are longer, infection is much higher risk and so you have a lot of these um, risks which would otherwise be uh, uncommon in closed fractures kind of coming to a head and much more common in the open fracture um, scenario. So that is my presentation on closed fractures. Here are some of my references. Uh, any comments or anything you say?